Dice Miner, a competitive game of dice collection, dice rolling, unique effects, uh, set in a fantasy world where, well, we know what we do. We mine uh, mountains. That's what people do in fantasy worlds. I saw the game at Gen Con 2022, and when I saw that, the centerpiece, the main element of the game, I knew I had to play. So, Dice Miner, each player will control a specific character, and these are the characters that are available. What matters in terms of gameplay are the symbols that you see at the bottom, and those are uh, the same symbols that you find on some of the dice. So basically, uh, having a certain character means having access to those symbols, which then you may also then receive from, from other things, from, from the dice. And then, ta-da, we got the mountain, uh, the mountain uh, which of course uh, is at an angle and you're gonna draw dice from a back and drop them until it forms that configuration. The game lasts three rounds, uh, at the end of each round the mountain will be empty and then you will refill it with dice from here, of course with the exception of the last round, you don't need to refill it then. You will score points at the end of every round, and at the end of the third round, the player with the highest score, with the most points, wins the game. That's what we're going for. Each round has four phases, of which two really are where you take actions, because the last two are scoring and replenish. So the main, the first main phase when gameplay happens is the excavation phase, which is when we acquire dice. We go around the table, taking turns, each player collecting a die. When you collect a die, the top needs to be free. So at the beginning of the round, only those two dice are available. And then only these two dice are available right now. If that's what was taken, now three dice are available for the next player to take. When you take a die, you have to keep the face that was facing forward, then you keep it face up. So that player took that die, the next player takes that die, the following player takes that, and we go back to player one, and so on and so forth. Maybe that's how it's going. Now, during the excavation phase, if you have a die showing a beer, or a mead, or a root beer, if you're playing with miners in the US, um, then you can give it to somebody. So if you give it to somebody, they get to re-roll it and everybody rolls and everybody else cheers, which we really do. It's really important as to the experience. Cheers! So the player who received the die rolls it and adds it to their trove. Suppose that that player decided to give that die to somebody else. And then as a reward for that, they get to draw two dice. For example, that one and that one. However, when you're getting dice because you offered a drink to somebody, you're also allowed to take dice from the side of the mountain. And so maybe I wanted this one and I wanted this one for whatever reason. So that's basically how we assign the dice. We go around uh, simply assigning dice. This way people grab it again occasionally. Hey, take a drink. Cheers! So now I can get two, for example, again, digging the sides. And we continue until all dice have been assigned. I'm not going in order anymore. I'm just going to give you a sense. So that's the idea. Yay! Then people get to activate effects. Magic phase. Then we move to the magic phase in which... Uh, we can activate these symbols here. These dice are magic dice. The number of symbols that you see there is the number of dice that you must re-roll if you choose to use that effect. If I want to use the die, I must re-roll two dice. I cannot uh, re-roll just one. This would give me three, zero or three, and this gives me just one. When you re-roll dice, you cannot re-roll the danger dice, which are these he ones here with the dark background, and say I decide to re-roll uh, these two. And I rolled, for example, and I totally did it, and no, no cheating at all, I'm rolling a 1 and a 2. Wasn't that amazing? Because that's kind of like what I wanted to roll. So, players uh, will use their magic dice, and then, and then it's time to score. When we score, there are several things that we we'll look at. One is sequences of numbers starting with one. One, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. 
each number in that sequence is worth a point. So I have a sequence of a 1 and a 2, that's 3 points. If I also had a 3 there, that would be 6 points. Easy enough. But if I had that sequence there, that is worth absolutely nothing because it doesn't start with 1. Womp, womp, saturn, bump. Also, beer doesn't, is not worth anything during the scoring phase. Then we have treasure dice, the ones showing those gems. Pretty simple, they are worth one point per gem showing. However, plot twist, the player with the most symbol showing can double their, their points. So right now, those are the only two dice, uh, treasure dice during the scoring phase. This player actually gets to score four points for those two ones. The hazard dice, they may show cave uh, or they may show dragons and there is a different number of cave and dragons on the different sides. Those are usually negative points, so basically each danger that you see there is, uh, is minus one. So I got four dragons and one cave in, that would be minus five points. However, rescues, heroes come to the rescue. If I have this symbol here, one of them will stop any number of cave ins and turn into positive points. That's the glory of preventing that damage. If I have a shield, a single shield will stop any number of dragons, turning those into positive points. So right now I have minus one for the cave in and plus four uh, for killing all those dragons. And this is also when, you may remember, these symbols come into play uh, precisely because of that. There's, now I have a lot of extra magic thanks to her. I'm gonna start looking for dragons if I have this guy because those are easy uh, points that I can score that way. So that's uh, that's the general idea of what scores and how. So sequences of numbers, treasures relative also to what other people have and that these may score positive or negative depending on whether they affect you or you're able to dominate the situation. Now what's important also we have we have these symbols here they allow you to keep some of your dice an equal number from turn from round to round because at the end of each round we're gonna re-roll all our dice that were not saved and then we're gonna keep them so that means that the next time we fill up the mine and we go through the excavation phase uh, we're gonna have more dice because the new dice that we take are added to our trove that means that there is a nice sense of escalation because it is in later rounds that you can really realistically uh, create some nice sequences from one to five for example you can have some really big hurts or dragons that you're slaying massive cave-ins that you're stopping lots of these treasures that you have created an engine around and you keep scoring double so it's nice because the three since you're adding every time the three Rounds are not a rinse and repeat situation, but again, things become more interesting and there definitely is an engine building element. Anywho, play three rounds, scoring at the end of each round, the player with the highest total at the end of the third round is the winner and the king of the dice miners of this fantasy mountain here. This game is a light game and it is such a fun light game. Uh, when we're thinking of light games, we want games that have simple procedures, a nice quick pace, but still have interesting decisions. And that balance is not always easy to strike, but this one does it perfectly. It's a game that puts all of those good things about gaming together. It is simple to play, it is engaging, and yet it is packed with a ton of small, but very interesting decisions. As chance would have it, I literally played this game with a professional mathematician who teaches math at IU and with a young player, I believe she's like 10 or 11, and the dad of, of the young player and myself. Uh, so quite a range of players, right? And we all loved it. We all enjoyed it very much. Uh, score was, mathematician wins, young player second, and the other guy and I, well, let's skip the details so we're, we were not in the top two. So, this is really 
a game that such a different range of people have enjoyed and everybody was involved and interested in making those decisions. Rolling the die and going for, yeah, cheer, it's silly, but you know what? It works, it was fun, it was ridiculous, why not? And it didn't feel like a cheap gimmick, it actually added to the experience. And when it comes to the decisions, again, they're small, they're quick, they're not too hard, but there are many of them and they are fun and interesting. Uh, say, giving the beer to somebody. It seems obvious because, well, I'm giving a die to somebody in exchange for the privilege of getting two dice out. So it's an advantage in giving to another player. That's a natural die that they get. So uh, easy, right? I'll give it to the player who is behind. However, my beer is, say, on a treasure die. Uh, and the player who is behind has some treasure dice. If I give them that, now they're going to score double, and maybe I wanted to score double. Or oh, that player who is behind has a lot of dragons, but my symbol, my, my, my beer die, if I give it to them, uh, may give them the ability of turning those negatives into positive. So it's not as obvious as I would have expected at the beginning. Magic dice. Oh, it's great to have three symbols, unless... Dang it, I really need two. I really don't want to reroll this one die here. Too much of a good thing, not enough of a good thing. Uh, when you make these decisions, what you reroll, what you say from turn to turn if you have the right symbols, um, when, you, when and how you use your uh, personal abilities, those are such simple ideas, so easy to understand that a really young player can play. And they work. I'm I, honest again. It happened that this time our young player was around ten or eleven. I could have played this with my kids when they were like five or six. That would have been no problem, and probably they would have slaughtered me also. Um, it's such a good game. Simple, light decisions. Uh, very nice art. A fun, a fun implementation of the mechanics in a package that has a has a distinct table presence and just draws you in. This may be just the perfect second game of the night. Second game of the night when people have played maybe like a big beast, a thinky game and they're tired. Then you want a game that doesn't take any time at all to set up. Dump those dice, give every player a tile and you set up the game. Uh, it's easy to teach, it's easy to play, it's quick to play and yet it is fun, which ultimately is the quintessential quality that we're looking uh, in games. So when we're playing games, such as for you know pure entertainment. If I'm looking, if I'm playing a historical game, I want to learn about the topic. I'm willing to invest time and resource and energy in that. But I also like to just have fun rolling dice, yelling cheers, and try to figure out if I get a sequence of one, two, three, and get more gems than you. Uh, there is, there are many, there's a time and a place, there are many times and many places where that approach to gaming is, is very welcome. When you just want to have fun, gamers just want to have fun from time to time, and Dice Miner would be a source of fun because it is a light game, it is a simple game, and it is an excellent one.